Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon. This is John Suntress. If this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please hit subscribe. Please hit like. Uh, share the show if you've enjoyed it with other friends. And uh, if you have any questions or comments about the show, you can reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Now, there are over 800 audio episodes that are not posted here on YouTube. So make sure you go and check out my website, wordballoon.com. Thanks a lot for watching. All right, folks, welcome back to Word Balloon. Uh, it's time for another Word Balloon lockdown quiz. At this time, the subject is old Hollywood. And I got a power couple, a Hollywood power couple to uh, play with. And uh, uh, both uh, longtime friends of the show, I want to welcome uh, Christina Rice, a fine author among her uh, works, a wonderful biography on uh, one of the forgotten leading ladies of the 30s, Anne Dvorak. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thank you. And her better half, uh, the, uh, former, half. <laughs> <laughs> the, the co-creator of Elk's Run and, uh, and uh, geez, I'm, I'm blanking right now, but Tumor and... Uh, wonderful runs on I Vampire and uh, Green Lantern, and now a uh, great television writer. It's Josh Fialkoff, everyone. Welcome back to Word Balloon, Josh. It's been far too long. Time. I know. I'm sorry, we, man. We, I, I always have to apologize. If I, long, and then I just yelled at you because we were always going to do this, and we hadn't done it. And you did the Bensons first, and that, it broke my little heart. <laughs> I've known you for like 15 years. How long have you known the Bensons? Let's be honest here. You're right. No, I, you're right about that, man. You're you're an OG word balloon guest, man. 15 years. You're damn right. I think I might have been on before Bendis, as a matter of fact. I believe you were, my man. I think I've been the gateway that got you Bendis. So I'm just saying, I gave you legitimacy when you needed it most. <laughs> hey, you and, and I'm going to get his name right, Noel Tuzon? Uh-huh, mm-hmm. You guys on Elk's Run absolutely blew my mind. What was your What was your Western five page anthology? Western, Western Tales of Terror. Western Tales of Terror, absolutely, man. It's Good the stuff. book that would never be collect, collected because I never thought to get people to sign contracts. <laughs> nobody, nobody, <laughs> told me, nobody told me about that part of the business. I mean, I would guess it seems obvious now. But yeah, I never really thought about that way back then. Believe me, man, I'm I'm transcribing the word balloon book, and I've got my uh, my releases ready to yeah. send out. And I'm expecting some classic people to go. No, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. my <laughs> friends per se, but you know, I can think of a couple people that I know in the business that'd be like, no. Yeah, that's like the the best advice I can give anybody who is self publishing is make sure people sign things and make sure you save your files somewhere that you can find them because. I have a bunch of hard drives that I guess if I spent a few weeks on, I could probably put together the issues, but. Well, honey, you, I think you, you have time now. That's true. Exactly. We are locked in the house. So, I mean, that's not going anywhere. I guess I can do that for a while. Well, and I mean, some of them are, are friends, aren't they? I mean, like Hester, like you could get a, a really, I mean, obviously you still want the paperwork, but like Hester would probably green light it, right? And Yeah, I no, don't I do it. You just got to, it's, it's a lot of, like anthologies are a pain. It's just a huge pain in the butt to like track everybody down. And True. like the money is so minuscule, but you still have to like work out percentages and it's stupid. It's just, it's the amount of work that it takes to do it versus sort of like the upside is painful. That's why you don't see, that's why it's so many of those anthologies that aren't the Warren anthologies or the or the EC anthologies, they sort of just disappear because yeah. it, it's just such a huge pain to get anything actually done. I hear you, man. No, I understand. Um, Christina, you, as I mentioned, the Andevoric book, which is fantastic. And uh, God, ever since uh, reading it, I, I've certainly uh, paid more attention when uh, a channel like Turner Classic Movies features her films and stuff. And you're working on a, I don't know if you want to say what you're working on right now or not. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm currently working on my second um, long form book, which is a biography of the actress Jane Russell. Because um, shockingly, the only book ever written about Jane was written by Jane. So it was her autobiography in 1985. So this will be the first biography on her. And um, my first draft is due in a week. So I am <laughs> desperately trying to finish that up right now. Wow. And Jane Russell, for people who maybe have heard the name but don't remember, a uh, beautiful brunette that uh, was certainly a, a peer to Marilyn Monroe. They were both in uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Blonde. I remember that. Yeah. And she was um, discovered by Howard Hughes uh, for the movie The Outlaw. Yes. Which, uh, I think she is known for uh, the photos, the George Harrell photos of her smoldering on a stack of hay holding a gun. Um, those were the photos that went around the world. And then, and, it, how long did it take for that movie to, to come out? 
What yeah. was the production? What was the production timeline? The production timeline. It was shot in late forty, early forty one. It had it world premiered in San Francisco in forty three. Uh, got a modest release in 46 and finally a wide release in 1950. So it took Insane. about 10 years for it <laughs> wow. to come out. Howard Hawks was initially the director and him and Howard Hughes didn't see eye to eye. So um, Hughes became the director and it is a very uh, interesting film. If you have spent 10 years, if you spend 10 years waiting for that movie, you, you would be so disappointed. So <laughs> you thought episode one was a letdown. Let me tell you. Yeah, Oof. when the book comes out, I will not be trying to yeah. arrange screenings of The Outlaw. <laughs> and and it was, um, I mean, really, you could tell the age difference because really she, uh, she was so young when they first shot it. And by the time she became a major star, yeah, I mean, it, well, 10 yeah. years. I mean, you know, yeah, her looks really, you know, yeah. changed. And then she grew into them. You know, she had a more mature beauty rather than that kind of ingenue almost quality that she had. And also, people should know, if if you've seen... The Aviator, the Hughes movie where, uh, you know, Leo uh, DiCaprio plays Howard Hughes, they spend a lot of time talking about uh, The Outlaw. Yeah, they do. It was it was a, you know, I don't know if significance the word, but it was certainly a big part of um, Hughes's film career. And, and DiCaprio actually went and interviewed Jane extensively when he was preparing to play that role. So she's a she's a big part of like Howard Hughes's um, story. So interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. And and my God, I, I you know I know there are just literally hundreds of photos, the pinup photos that she did once she was signed. Oh, uh, was, I'm assuming at RKO, that, or maybe it started before then. No, it's before then. Um, Hughes didn't get involved in RKO until late '40s, early '50s. So, so in the '40s, I mean, there were just thousands of photos of her that were taken. Right. Um, she with her nickname in the 40s was the motionless picture actress because her pictures were um distributed all over the world and people knew who she was but they didn't actually you know see her in a film for years but that was her full-time job in you know like 41 42 was just posing for pictures wow no that's amazing I, i'm looking forward to it i uh when it's ready uh you'll have to come back and we'll we'll do a new talk that would be great oh my pleasure excellent um well, you know, again, you can tell by uh, the subject that we're discussing right now that this is what we're going to be talking about, Old Hollywood. Josh, I f before I uh, forget, um, run down some of the TV shows that you've been writing for, uh, you yeah. know, in the last couple of seasons. <laughs> They're all, you know, they have those uh, brilliant but canceled things they show, those, those, uh, they do those marathons. These are not on those. Um, so what have I done? I worked on Chicago Med on NBC for a little while. Yeah. Uh, I worked on a, a really good sci-fi show called Incorporated. Um, what was I on after that? I did a. Oh, I was on a show called Wisdom of the Crowd with Jeremy Piven. Oh right yeah, yeah. Be me too. Uh, I'm apparently legally not allowed to talk about it, but my God, do I want to? Um, uh, and then the last show I was on was a show called The Code that was on CBS that was a military law procedural. Yes. With, uh, as a uh, established comic book writer with my training, doing all the things that are not military law, I will tell you. Definitely should not write military law shows. I really <laughs> learned that pretty well, pretty quick. Yeah, but we got to a trip to New York. Out we there. did. We got a nice trip to New York. <laughs> we stayed in a former Trump hotel that wasn't a Trump hotel anymore by the time we got there. So that was, was nice. Okay. <laughs> they ripped his name off the wall just to make sure everything was okay. Um, but, you know, and then I've been doing the past, like, Jesus, the past year I've been working. I've actually, I sold a couple pilots. Um, I just adapted the bunker. For NBC for pilot season. That Congrats, man! One of your creator own books. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get picked up. We're taking it out and shopping at places again. So hopefully, we'll hopefully we'll do it. Unfortunately, a book uh, or a show about a global pandemic. I could go either way, right? Yeah, now. not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least it's about how the government is completely incompetent. Oh goddamn. <laughs> so yeah, that part's not great. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's actually been it's been. Uh, it's been sort of a nice change because I get the, you know, TV versus comics is actually uh, like a, I don't know what the right word is. It's just such a like slow, such a much slower pace, bizarrely. <laughs> Even though you're still trying to put a thing out every week and you still have to do all this work, you actually have time to kind of sit and work and revise and really like get things together properly. Whereas in comics, it is, you're essentially on a mad dash to not drown constantly no matter what um you know whether people will actually admit that or not i don't know but that is like my experience at least was always that working 
working big two anyways. Um, so no, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. I've taken a break from comics, but I think we've talked about a couple, there's a couple of projects. I've talked about um, a couple of creator owned things and then possibly a, a jobby job one. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully I'll have comics coming out again soon ish. That'd be great, man. Well, we mentioned the buck bunker and Elks run and tumor Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a, if you, you know, go to Amazon or, or, well, right now, obviously Diamond, uh, is closed, but, uh, check with your local shop. I bet they might have some, uh, some Josh Fialkoff they crates. Uh, you no, know, I think Oni, if you go to onipress.com, they have, uh, they are my publisher for virtually all of my creator own books. Um, everything should be in print and they should be able to refer you to where you can pick them up. That's great. And Christina, the, the title of your Anne Dvorak book? Uh, Anne Dvorak, Hollywood's Forgotten Rebel from University Press of Kentucky. Excellent. And uh, we likely have uh, Christina's uh, book cover as her avatar as uh, as we're talking uh, tonight and playing the game. So uh, we should probably get into it now. Old Hollywood. Um, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll, should we do here? I'm going to I'm going to keep score and we <laughs> could do either. Should we do best of 20? Like our first person of 20 or uh, or is that too long? Your first to 20. No, we Your can first do it. To 20. Right. Excellent. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to say, Christina, go first, and then Josh, and then I'll go. Uh, I'll go last. Okay. All right. All right. So You're rolling. Uh, I'm rolling. Okay. Uh, and I got blue. All right, blue. We are using uh, Trivial Pursuits uh, Silver Screen Edition, and uh, also I've got the uh, Turner uh, Classic Movie Trivia Book. So every now and then, if uh, you don't want to answer a question in uh, one of the categories of Trivial Pursuit. We can go to other uh, subjects. So would you like a set question or a uh, tr uh, Turner Classic movie question? Oh, man. All right. I'll, I'll try the Trivial Pursuit. I have very low expectations of myself. Well, here, let's see. Uh, what town was rebuilt as it looked in 1900 and torched for a 1970 Charlton Heston film? Ooh, this is a toughie. Uh, Charlton Heston made no movies with Anne Dvorak, so I am. Yeah, I'm hip. I, I, I don't know. Well, I'll be honest. I don't remember this film. Honolulu. Uh, Honolulu. Uh, nope. <laughs> what happened in 1900? I don't know. I don't know. You're, we're going to have to consult the islands <laughs> and find out. Wow. All right. All right. I don't feel so bad. All right, Josh. I got pink. Pink. Pink is titles. All right. What film featured the emotionless pod people? Is that Invasion of the Body Snatchers? That is correct. 1951? Is it 51, 53? I don't have the year, but uh, that's fine. Josh is on the board. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, what no. Now, no, we, we rotate. What do you, what do you got? Hold what on. Color? I'm going to roll my die. I have a five. So and I will. I'll absolutely. take. Uh, yeah. What is that? Uh, pro production. Production. Okay. Oh, what was to have been the title of the never made sequel to Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Oh Jesus. Uh, the way back. I don't know. Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. Oh, I do vaguely remember hearing that. I don't know what the fourth kind is. I don't think I want to know. I imagine I it involves probing of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, Richard Dreyfus really dodged a bullet. <laughs> I'm telling you, they got inside me. <laughs> it meant something to me, personally. Really. I'm, te I'm teaching uh, at Columbia College, and it is fun, but I'm like, oh, Christ, I'm Mr. Holland. What the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Christina, you're up. All right. uh, purple? Is purple a thing? Purple. Uh, purple is brown because there's no brown. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's right. They did change the color. Purple is brown. That's correct. All right. It's brown on screen. That's on screen. Okay. What did nine Tana leaves brood when the moon is high bring back to life in a 1932 Boris Karloff film? Nine Tana leaves. Yes. You do? Yes. Wow. Uh, 
I think. I could be wrong. Yeah, you could do the math and maybe figure it out. And you know, uh, say again. A, a mummy. The mummy is correct. Very good. Hey. It's the mummy. It's the second one, right? Uh, no, it says it's the first one. No, really? Thirty-two is the first one. Is it? One's the first Frankenstein. Thirty-one. Oh, oh, I see. You mean the second Universal film? Yeah. No, I meant the second second mummy. I thought mummy came out before it. Yeah, mummy's, no? mummy's hmm. thirty-two. Hmm. One, well, yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't Frankenstein thirty one? Yeah, yeah. All right, never mind. I still, did. I still knew. I still yeah. got it. I still no, got good it. job. Good job. I was overthinking it. Yeah, all good. Uh, all right. Blue, blue. Okay, what city were the Kane mutineers court martialed in? Uh, can I change category? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like Port au Prince. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. San Francisco. Yeah, uh, Broncos. Yep. All right. Once again, I got it roll. I have a six. So that's okay. portrayals, I guess. Portrayals. What real life boxing manager did Ernest Borgnine portray in The Greatest? Uh, that would be Angelo Dundee. Jesus Christ! <laughs> I'm a boxing fan. How have I not seen the greatest? Of course, I've seen the greatest. Amazing. Well played. Wow. <laughs> not a great movie. The look on his face when she was reading it was like, "What is this question? This is ridiculous." It's, it's, it's the Ali. It's the Ali biography that he starred himself in, and um, Robert yeah. Duvall is in it, and um, uh, John. Oh God, the guy who wakes up with the horse's head in The Godfather. Oh. Character actor John, you know who I'm talking about. I know who you're talking about. I can't remember his last name, mm -mm. but I mean, yeah, seriously, like all star cast, all star oh. cast. Yeah, I've never seen it. Yeah, late uh, seventy seven. I want to say or seventy eight. I mean, it was before mm -hmm. Ali's Parkinson syndrome really kicked in, so he was he did okay, and uh, and yeah, I mean, yeah, he's Ali, he's charming, but yeah, it's a it's not a great movie. I mean, we have his toothbrushing album. We have his. Have have, not did seen. you know that he made? It's called Muhammad Ali and the Tooth Raiders. And Mr. Tooth Decay. Yeah, you got to fight Mr. Tooth Decay. Sure. Yeah. We have that. We have that. That and, his, uh, and then the Quincy Jones produced record we have as well. Which is, is that? Does that have his cover of Stand by Me? No, it doesn't. That's the the. No. Quincy Jones one is the is the I am the greatest where it's his spoken word. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All the poetry. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, Very funny. Maybe. Amazing. Yes. Hilarious. All right. Well, we're all tied at one right now, and it's uh, okay. Christina's turn. Okay. Uh, orange. Orange is, uh, once again, portrayals. And the question is, what boxer did Errol Flint play, oh, boy, boxing, in a 1942 movie? Well, the movie is Gentleman Jim. Correct. Jim. Oh, God. Jim is the last name. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. So close. So close. Did it start with a C? It did start with a C. I'll give you that in. It's not Corbett, is it? It is Corbett, correct. Yay! Hey! Very nice. Excellent. First, uh, first gloved heavyweight champion. He beat uh, John L. Sullivan, who was the last bare-knuckle boxer. Great movie, too. Alexis Smith. Lovely. Yeah. Yes. So many, and then uh, Jack Carter, really funny in it as his best friend. Yeah, I love, I'm a big Errol Flynn guy. I'm a, I really enjoy, and of course, what a life. Good Lord. How yeah. big an Errol Flynn fan are you, Chrissy? If our, if our daughter was a boy, we were going to name her Flynn. Ah, that's awesome. And, yeah. and forgive me, what is your daughter's name again? Gable. Gable, that's right. Yeah, that's awesome. Seriously, yeah. that's a terrific name. That's lovely. Um, all right. All right, Josh. Our green. Green. Green is production. What film did Olivia de Havilland make as a favor to Betty Davis? Uh, it's the movie. Af it's not it's the movie after Baby Jane. No. Yep, you're on the right track. Is it? We have it, and I feel like we watched it. Recently, we didn't. We didn't watch it. No, we do have it. Do it's have on it. one of these shelves behind me, isn't it? <laughs> it's just so sitting it probably there. Probably is taunting you. Oh, I don't know. 
Okay. Hush, hush, sweet Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte. God damn it. We have a poster. Can I buy you a poster? You might have bought me a I poster. I think I bought you the poster. <laughs> That's outstanding. What did you guys think of the FX show? Um, and now I'm blanking on the name of it again. Feud? I Feud. loved it. Yeah, wasn't it great? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And I, I love that it introduced people to both of them. Yeah. Agreed. Yes. That was a good Ryan Murphy year. Like that and uh, the OJ show were both yeah. just fantastic. Agreed. Absolutely, man. And uh, and I also liked uh, the sequel uh, with um, Bob Fosse and, um, and 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 Gwen Verdon. We didn't watch it. Like we the timing was it. the timing yeah. was bad because she was working on your book, and I was yeah. trying to get a pilot finished. I think it's it's worth finding. I mean, it's uh, on, and especially now when you know we're we're looking for things to watch, and I'm not only recommending it to you but the listeners as well. It's really both seasons of Feud were just outstanding. So Sam Rockwell and um, oh god uh, from Dawson's Creek. Michelle Williams. Yes. Michelle Williams, thank you. Yes. And my guy, I mean, seriously, great casting in both cases. Yeah. So even, and I don't remember the name of the actress, but the person that plays Liza Minnelli, and this is cabaret era Liza and everything. Fantastic. Really they neat. She got Liza Minnelli. <laughs> she could do it. Listen, <laughs> she's ageless. She I'm, sure, I'm sure she'd like to. I, I'm sure she auditioned for it. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, and I don't know you. the last time you guys saw cabaret, you go back to Liza's prime, she's got nothing to apologize for. I mean, I know she's a, the poor thing's a wackadoo these days, and living that uh, in that family can only hurt you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, in, at her prime, I mean, she was really great. I think anybody that can, you know, be Judy Garland's child and just establish yourself the way she has is just astounding. Yeah. Like, what did you guys think of uh, Renee Zellweger's film, Judy? We haven't we haven't watched it yet. I got a screener yeah. of it and I watched it. I like it. <laughs> we probably this we get to I don't even know if we got a screener for it. Yeah, like we don't I've been so yeah, I've been trying to finish my once I finish my book next week, man. I'm just gonna sit on the couch. At a girl. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, I'm rolling. Uh, I have a four. Okay, so that is brown. That's brown, yeah, purple on, on screen. Okay. What kind of birds did Robert Stroud first turn his attentions to in Birdman of Alcatraz? I'm assuming pigeons. I'm going to say pigeons. Uh, sparrows. Ah. Huh. Great Burt Lancaster movie. I want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a uh, brown. Okay. That's also uh, on screen. And we got what was actress Susan Backlinney's distinction in Jaws? Uh, is she the first victim? Of that is correct. Very good. Hey. Yeah. Christina, man, commanding lead right now. Woo Three to one. Orange? Orange. Also portrayals. <clears throat> Who played Sam in Casablanca? Oh, God, what's his name? <sighs> She's looking at me with so much disgust. I am not. <laughs> I know this one, too. <laughs> oh, God, what's his name? Hold on. It's coming. No Do you want to switch to horror? Oh, it's Dooley Wilson. It is Dooley Wilson. Damn, it there it is. There <laughs> Atta boy. Um, took me a little while. No worries. All right. I have a four. What was that? Uh, a four. Four. Okay. I think your dice is loaded. I know, man. It's it's a dice app. Uh, what actress excused herself in 1930s Hell's Angels saying, pardon me while I slip into something more comfortable? I'm going to assume it's Mae West. Uh, no, that is Jean Harlow. Oh, yeah, duh, son of a... Yeah, of course. And that's a Howard she Hughes. Asked, that is a Howard yeah, Hughes. that's right. I've, and I was like, maybe it's the Hughes film, but I'm like, oh, maybe it isn't, but yeah. of course it is. Yeah, and she actually says, um, would you be shocked if I slipped into something more comfortable? I think um, there's a letter. I think there's a letter, a letter to be written. <laughs> there are. I, I have read that uh, in the Pursuit game, there are a few, like, misanswers purposely to, like, keep people from copyright infringement or whatever. Really? Hmm. That's what I heard. I don't know. Canadian produced game, Trivial Pursuit. Hmm. 
Hmm. I did not know that. There you go. So Christine is up. I have purple or brown. Purple is brown. All good. What two languages were subtitled in A Bridge Too Far? French and German? Well, you got one of them correct. It was Dutch and German. Wow. Mm. I'm going to do, do horror. Sure. Okay. Christine, <laughs> ask, ask you a horror yeah. question. All good. Okay. I'm getting out the horror cards. No problem. We'll vamp. And I have yellow. Oh, they, they have tri Trivial Pursuit uh, in yeah, horror. Yeah. It's horror, yeah. That's awesome. Okay. I don't know what the categories are, but... Um, the Burning, 1981, is the film debut of what Academy Award winning actress? God damn it. I do know who that, <laughs> I do shockingly know who the, who the executive producer of it is. Harvey Weinstein. Is it really? <laughs> it is. Um, I want to like visualize the poster. I have the soundtrack and I know exactly where it is on the shelf behind me. I don't own the movie because of Harvey Weinstein. They put it out after everything happened. Wow. Sure extra money for Harvey Weinstein, I'm sure. Amazing. 1981 film. Interesting. Um, it was the first, I believe it's the first thing he ever produced. It was pretty, I think it was like pre-Dimension and he used, his plan was to use that money to start Dimension. Crazy. All of which is me to say, I do not know the answer. <laughs> I'm Holly Hunter. Oh, God damn it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's like, um... Uh, Kevin Costner being in the trauma movie, and I forget which one it was. There's a lot of there's a lot of that though. Uh, Ma Matthew McConaughey is in the uh, fourth Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's awesome. Or of course, television. You know, yeah. you see like Liam Neeson when he was a baby on Miami Vice, or I love Kojak for that reason, and yeah. like Stallone like two years before Rocky, stuff like that. Yeah, oh, you bad. know, too funny, man. All right, my turn again. I'm rolling. And I have a five. Okay. Five is production. Mm -hmm. What film did director Stanley Kramer call a sort of vacation film, which I did in a little town on a hilltop in Italy? A sort of vacation. Um, I'm going to guess that Catherine Hepburn film, Summertime? No, The Secret of Santa Vittoria. Ah, all right. Never heard that, of that well film. spoken of classic. Once again, this is why I love Silver Screen because it is really hard. It's really hard. Okay, um, orange. Orange. Okay, that's portrayals. What private eye did Frank Sinatra play in Lady in Cement? He actually made several movies with this character. <sighs> Sam Spade. I have no idea. No, it was an original character. Tony Rome, everybody. Nope. And, and they are a lot of fun to watch. They might be and likely are a bit misogynistic in the, in the same vein as the <laughs> Helm films. <laughs> Not but they're, oh my God. What are, you yeah, what, are, what are the odds? Exactly. But they were kind of, they were made at the same time that uh, Dean Martin was doing the Matt Helm movies. And God, Lainey Kazan is in one. And Dan Blocker from Bonanza is like a mob enforcer in one. And it's, I mean, that's why they're, they're a blast to watch just to see all the faces. Are they like the Matt Helm movies where they're, where they're doofy or are they? They were a little more serious than the Matt Helm movies. A right. little more. Cause you know, Frank, no, right. no jokes, Yeah, <laughs> but I like them. And yeah, ladies, lady in cement might've been the one with, uh, Lainey Kazan. And yeah. this is sultry late sixties, torch singing Lainey Kazan and everything. Huh? So yeah. You know, that's the thing, man. Everyone loves Elaine because they had a great character actor. And she's she's lovely. But yeah, man, back back in the 60s, it's like, whoa, Lady Kazan. I believe she was in Playboy. Wow. So yeah, there you okay. go. There's your there's your third book, uh, Sorry. Christina. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, did you know that um Frank Sinatra and Jane Russell did a movie together? No, which one? Double Dynamite. I have not seen that one. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds like a Bowery Boys movie. It is Double not Dynamite. very good. It's in uh it's in <laughs> Groucho Marx. Wow. Oh, you know, that's interesting. Holy cow. And it was, um, the original title was It's Only Money, and uh, Howard Hughes changed the title to Double Dynamite. <laughs> Hilarious. Wow. I love uh, I love her movie with uh, Mitchum. I'm sorry. I love her movie with Mitchum Macau. Oh, I love Macau, too. Yeah. And uh, his kind of woman is sure. 
wacky as all hell, but a lot of fun. That's cool. Wacky again because of Howard Hughes. Uh, so it's uh, Josh's turn. I have yeah. I, orange. Orange. Also portrayals. Okay. Uh, what actress portrayed Thomasine in The Witch, 2015? Oh, for God's sake! It's the girl who's in um, it's the girl who's in Emma. It just came out. Huh. Do you want to go back to silver screen? Yeah, go back to silver screen. <laughs> I wasn't planning on it. You are, I'm ready with the silver screen question. You want silver screen? You want silver screen? Want silver Do you screen. want the answer to this one? Yes. Anya Taylor Joy. God damn it! Uh, right. uh, this is a tough one. All right. Who played Tom Oseola, one of the drunken Indian brothers in Key Largo? The Native American brothers. Damn. Nothing. I got nothing. God. Good. Bro. Really? Because it's a pretty obvious uh, Native American actor. The problem is I'm going to sound racist. That's my real my real worries. I don't want to be wrong and be racist about it. Well, if it's his name, it's his name. But it does right. yeah, the one I'm thinking of. It's not a racist name because uh, you know. Forgive me. Were you thinking of Iron Eyes Cody? I'll I'll say yeah. the name. Yeah. Yes. No. No. It's, <laughs> no. And I believe. And you're right. You might be right in terms of. I think that was a pseudonym because maybe Iron Eyes Cody was actually Italian. He was right. Italian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It made a movie with Jane Russell. As a matter of fact. Made a couple of movies with Jane Russell. Ah, there you go. But no, uh, I was thinking of the Lone Ranger's sidekick, Jay Silverheels, everybody. Oh. And yeah, you can see, I mean, it's it's clearly, I love that movie, and I'm sure you guys too. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're at all a Lone Ranger fan, it's like, wow, there's Jay Silverheels. That's fantastic. So, and he was a real native. Yeah, I never mean, put together that it's the same guy. No. Yeah, I never put it together. Huh. Well, I don't know, man. That face, it, it, for me, I mean, I loved, I watched those, man, those things are now like watching an hourglass. Yeah. I mean, they move glacially slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, my turn again. Mm-hmm. And I have, man, I have a six. A six. Uh, who played Mary to Dustin Hoffman's John? Ooh. Oh. Shoot. I'm just going to guess. I really don't know that movie. Lee Remick. Mia Farrow. Oh, shame on me. But what movie is that? I have no Speaking idea. John and Mary, I believe. Yeah. I think it is. <laughs> that is. Okay, I have Green. Green. Green is production. Mm-hmm. What was Steven Spielberg's last film before Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Was it was it Jaws? It was Jaws. Very good. Man, Christina cleaning up in this category. Very nice. <clears throat> Yellow. Do you want horror or silver screen? I'll do silver screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want me to do? Yeah. Okay, go I'm ready. Uh what who discovered on the death of her husband, Marty Melcher, in nineteen sixty eight that he and her lawyer had squandered her twenty million dollar fortune? Who discovered on the death of her husband, Marty Melcher, in 1968, that he and her lawyer had squandered her $20 million fortune? <laughs> I didn't like the, I didn't like the, uh, I didn't like the emphasis you're putting on there, John. Well, Melcher, because, uh, yeah, there's actually a current movie that ties to the family. I got nothing. No idea. Uh, uh, Terry Melcher was his uh, son, and Doris Day was uh, the wife. Yes. Doris Day. Um, yeah, right. And that's why she did the terrible CBS sitcom because she was broke, and they've been they've been after her to do a TV show for years, and so she's like, "Well, I guess I got to do it," and it totally made her money back. So, nice happy ending to that sad story. Yeah. Huh? Poor Doris Day. No. There you go. So, all right, and now it's my turn again. Excuse me. And I have a two. Okay, titles. Um, what film had Lee Marvin mounting Project Amnesty? Project Amnesty, Lee Marvin. I'm going to guess Gorky Park. Dirty Dozen. Oh, 
Oh, that makes sense. Of course. That whole card is Dirty Dozen. That yeah, whole card is all card. Dirty Dozen. Yeah, you know, they, 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 the, 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 there was a Maltese Falcon card. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's and of course that makes sense and everything. Great movie. Okay, uh, Yellow. Yellow is off screen. What city was home to the original Roxy Theater? Isn't New York? New York is correct. Yeah, cleaning up. Christina, five. Oh my, my easy ones. I'll do one. We do one from the TCM book. Oh, sure. All right. Random. I like doing, I'm just going to, I'm trying to do all the different ones. I want to see what the world is like out there. <laughs> I totally understand. I got to look up the, uh, where the answers are too. Uh, who said of Jackie Chan, my dog likes Jackie more. And so my dog likes Jackie more. And so does my mother. Was it Bruce Lee, Chris Tucker, Owen Wilson, or Sylvester Stallone? Owen Wilson. And let's find out. Let's see. Where are the answers? Now there's suspense. I like this. I know. All right. Hold on. Really on tenor out here. Really just. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was Owen Wilson. That's correct. Nice. Hey. hey. Very it's nice. Owen Wilson. I would have guessed Chris Tucker myself, but I like yeah. it. Yeah, I would have too. My turn again. All right. I have a six. Six. I'll take Beatles this time. Oh, you want Beatles? Okay. The Beatles. All right. Let's bust open Beatles. You're going to learn what regret looks like. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure. I bet it's hardcore. It's insane. Okay. <sighs> okay, so orange. In help, which beetle is pulled out of bed during an unsuccessful attempt to remove his ring? Oh, that's Ringo. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, I remember the plot of help, sure. <laughs> oh, I was all set with like, well, actually, it was also Ringo when uh, they're in the men's room and the blow dry the, the hand dryer like is out of control and it's like sucking, it's trying to suck his ring off and it like they rips their clothes and all that stuff. God, those movies are weird. Yes, they were. <laughs> Richard weird. Lester. <laughs> Elvis is so weird. Um, yeah, really, because, yeah, the Elvis movies were like, you know. Well, actually, Stone for uh, King Creo was actually a good movie, a good dramatic movie of Elvis's. Is it, though? <laughs> is it? For Elvis. I don't know that I've actually ever seen an Elvis I mean, movie. he's just so pretty, I guess. It's like he's well, just, it was, pretty, it was, and Margaret's pretty, or whoever's around with him. Well, I mean, and I love Viva, Viva Las Vegas is all eye candy, and I do love that movie. Yeah. Uh, and God, they're both like in their primes. But um, no, um, uh, King Creo is based on that great novel, Stone for Danny Fisher. Right. Carolyn Jones is in it, and Walter Matthau. It's a, it's a, I think yeah. it's a decent movie. And I also like Jailhouse Rock. I think Jailhouse Rock for what it is, you know. I love Elvis. I love Elvis as like, and I love the the I love like the conceptual Elvis as well, you know. But then you watch the movies and it's just like nails on a chalkboard. For the most part, yeah, harem scarum, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. But he is pretty. Yeah, he is pretty. He's very pretty. Um, all right, Christina. Okay, I have blue. Blue, or you can do a Turner question. Uh, no, I'll stick with silver screen. All right. What bridge did a show off fall off of in Saturday Night Fever? Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Bridge is correct. All right. Well done. I'm going to do horror. All right. I feel good about this one. I hear you. <laughs> I did so well. We played it like last week and I did so well. You did do so well. <laughs> uh, purple, brown, whatever it is. Purple brown. Um, what is the name of the hunchback assistant of Dr. Frankenstein in Frankenstein, 1931? Well, it's not, it's not Igor. It's not right. Igor. Oh, God, is it... God, we just watched it, too. Like, not that long ago. Didn't you and Gable go see it? We did. Vista? I saw it not too long ago. Is it, like, Aldrich? No. No. What is it? Fritz. Fritz. Okay, and Dwight was Dracula, right? Yes. I want to say okay, because I yeah, Dwight was on my brain, but I'm like, no, I know that's Dracula. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Very cool. Too funny. I have a four. Okay. What do you want? Um, I'm going to do another Beatles question. Okay. Uh, which Beatles song opens with the group singing Oh Yeah four times? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, that is I'll Get You. That is correct. Woo! I'll get you in the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Beatles. Jesus. I did. I, I uh, for my radio production class at Columbia, I had them uh, put together a, uh, a a commercial for a Beatles box set. And they're like, can we use our own music? And I'm like, no. Then I go, and the reason why is in the real world, you don't get to choose what commercials you have to make. It's given to you. So you have to you have to listen to songs you wouldn't necessarily listen to and hear how they cut well their together. Music so is no better than the Beatles. It's What's probably, that? I'm sure their music is probably better than the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, there's no well that's like uh did you see that um thing on Twitter today, the hashtag of Quincy Jones that some DJ no. said Kanye was greater than Quincy Jones. <laughs> um, did the students know who the Beatles were at least? They oh, you know it's funny, Christina, they uh I had them cut up a Seinfeld television commercial to create one. And one kid goes, so the Seinfeld show, was it a sketch show? And I'm like, no, it was a sitcom. And I've got 12 students. I'm like, all right, how many of you have watched Seinfeld? Four hands go up. I'm like, you guys are lucky I didn't give you I Love Lucy to cut up. Wow. <laughs> and that's that's the problem with, with you know, not yeah. broadcast anymore. <laughs> well, like and everyone everyone has their own sphere of entertainment. And and in more choices within that sphere than we ever had. And I'm older than you guys, so even you know you guys are younger than me. But yeah, I mean it's no. Why would they? Why would they watch this stuff? I oh, know, like our kid doesn't know any pop music whatsoever. Really? So like <laughs> we'll hear pop music, that we'll see kids singing along to it, and I'll be like, "Honey, do you know what that is?" And she's like, "Nope." Like, have you heard it before? She's like, "Not really." We're like, "Yes, yeah, we win." <laughs> the Beatles. Yeah. That's good. I like it. Uh, all right. Uh, what's uh, it's Christina's turn? Yeah, I have brown. Brown. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. What Betty Davis Paul Hunreed film did Oscar and Her Oski and Hermie take their dates to see in the movie Summer of Forty Two? So now Voyager. It is now Voyager. Well done. Wow, you got seven points, Christina. Nice going. You're killing us. All right, told you. Told you. Seven. Uh, Christina has seven. You and I have three, Josh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and this hasn't worked out great. I'm going to go back to horror orange. <laughs> okay. Okay. What was the name of the clipper ship destroyed in the 1880s in the fog? 1980. Ooh, that's hard. Oh my god! You just watched that I watched twice. Like, I just watched it like four times. <laughs> I would never remember that. Oh, Me either. I'm like staring into her soul for an answer. <laughs> I got no, no idea. The Elizabeth Dane. Right. God damn it. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm rolling. I have a three. Okay. Uh, you want Beatles? Um, that's a good question. Yes. Let's okay. stick with the Beatles. Okay. Who joined John's band, the Quarrymen, on bass guitar in early 1960, even though he wasn't a musician? Oh, that's Stu Sutcliffe. Yeah. That is correct. You're getting all the easy ones. That is so you know, I was, uh, I literally was watching, you know, there's Backbeat, and that's a great movie. But before it, a great TV movie that Dick Clark produced uh, in the seventies called birth of the Beatles mm -hmm. and it's oh, the yeah. same subject and it's on YouTube for people listening. And I, I, I just, you know, got nostalgic for it. And I watched it the other day. I love that movie. It holds up. I haven't seen it. Yeah, reasonably, I mean, reasonably. So I'm more forgiving. I mean, good Lord. I watched the, uh, the Paul Michael Glaser Houdini TV movie with Sally Struthers and Vivian Vance. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and really, I loved every second of it. I, that's, I mean, really, there are so many great YouTube Vance? recordings. Yeah, <laughs> Vivian Vance plays Sally Struthers, like the family friend. But yeah, it's so great to see Vivian Vance in like something significant beyond Lucy. 
So oh, come on, beer. Wow. <laughs> and Bill Bixby plays uh, a medium at the end of the movie and has this great, like very dramatic like moment in the film and stuff. It's 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 hilarious. Does he at the end of the movie walk away with a coat that he pops the collar and then puts out his thumb? <laughs> Sadly no. No. Sadly, no. And Sally Struthers' uh, dramatic role, you know. But you forget pre all in the family, you know. She she made a couple of interesting movies in the uh, early seventies and late sixties, I guess. <laughs> Very funny. Okay, I have blue. Blue. Okay, blue is setting. Or do you want to turn her question? I'll stick with silver screen. And a girl. All right. What sea did the explorers emerge into? In uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, the Pat Boone classic. <laughs> Which is really not a phrase that you hear very often. No. Is it the Black Sea? I have no idea. It's the Mediterranean. Oh. It's close. Mm. They're very near each other. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm going to go back to silver screen. Okay. Blue. Blue? What Brando film concerned the rehabilitation of an Oklahoman village in by the U.S. Army. What Brando film concerned the rehabilitation of an Okinawan, I'm sorry, Oklahoma, oh. Okinawan village. That's very different. The, yeah, it is very different. Is that, um, God, what's it called? I heard rehab and I was like, the men, it is definitely the men. It's the I love, men. That's so funny. I the men. Yeah, I man. know. If I was on Jeopardy, I would have lost. Yeah, so okay, one. Oh, it's not one I not one I jacks, right? No. No, it's not one I jacks. It's earlier. I got nothing. Is it like Tea House or something? Yep. It is Tea House of the August Moon. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Wife. I know. She's awesome. My turn again? Yes. I have a four. Okay. And I will take uh, silver screen this time. Okay. What cowboy star wielded a 12 foot bullwhip? That would be Lash LaRue. That would be. Who finished his career doing porn. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> really? When you got a whip yep. that big, what else are you gonna do? Exactly. He was a fifties. He was a fifties cowboy guy, kind of at the tail end of the, uh, you know, uh, low budget uh, westerns and stuff. And uh, then, yeah, in the uh, late sixties and early seventies, he was doing porn. Yeah. Lash Larue, everybody. Yeah. Uh, yellow. Yellow. Yellow is off screen. Who is Burt Reynolds' love interest on and off screen in Smokey and the Bandit? Sally Field. Sally Field is correct. Ridiculous. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> what, that's easy? Yes. Yeah. You're like King. You're like Tom King. God, Tom was the same way. I can't believe it. Come on. That was easy. It's like, hey, man. Uh, it's random. Orange, also silver screen. Who portrayed Charles Bronson's Sniveling two time manager, two timing manager in hard times. I didn't think it was sniveling. Hard times is the bare knuckle uh, boxing movie, right? It's not Burgess Meredith, is it? <laughs> Come on, Rock. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. I got not, no idea. James Coburn. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's a good movie. I've seen it before. I can't picture him in it. <laughs> like, I can't I can't see him. Oh, he, um, well, and again, this is a TV movie. Another one I got to look up and see. He's he's in, like, uh, you know, Great Fedora. He looks like he did when he was uh, the Continental Op in the Dashiell Hammett uh, Dane Curse. Uh, you know, so yeah, seven, early 70s. So, hmm. good stuff. All right, my turn again. I'm going to take a Beatles question, and I have a five. In what hotel was Give Peace a Chance recorded? Oh. I'm going to guess because I'm know i pretty certain it was in New York. Uh, the Plaza. The Queen Elizabeth Hotel. Ah. Oh, wow. Did you ever see the, the my favorite portion of the bed in was when uh, Little Abner creator Al Cap 
came to uh, yell at Lennon and Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, man, and I don't know if you know, but like, uh, man, Al Cap uh, used to meet to the hell out of a lot of college co-eds and finally got busted for it. And that's what canceled Little Abner. And of all people, the guy that uh, blew the whistle on him was Britt Hume, who was a leg man for Jack Anderson, the great Washington, D.C. columnist. And Britt Hume found out that he was harassing young co-eds. And he's like, we got to go public with this. And uh, Jack Anderson's like, well, let's hear his side of the story. He's like, his side of the story? He goes, there's like six cases here. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you're right. All right, we got to nail him. And so, yeah, it was, you know, but again, this was early 70s. But of all people, Fox's own Brady Hume. Huh. Huh. So there you go. <laughs> all right, I have blue. Blue. Blue is uh, setting. Yeah. Man, this is oblique. What film was set at Lincoln International? Although, airport airport is correct. Man, nine. <laughs> airport seventy, airport seventy six. <laughs> the first one, the the first, you know I love that film because it's it was made in nineteen seventy and it being on the the cusp of the decade, it half the time it looks like a seventies movie, half the time it looks like a sixties movie, and I feel that way about uh, Sunrise at Campobello. Because it was made in 1960, and it sometimes looks like a 50s movie, and sometimes looks more modern. It's funny that's part like when they make TV shows, like period piece shows. That's one of the reasons why it's so expensive, is that you're not actually just buying stuff from the period it takes place in. You're buying stuff from like the period and then back 20 years. Mm. But people don't keep aged stuff. Everyone keeps everything that looks great. Sure, you have to age it, but you have to age it in such a way that when you give it back at the end. They can make it clean and look good again. Interesting. It, it's just like this huge, weird, like twisty nightmare. That's why all those shows just cost a goddamn fortune. Everything. That's uh, amazing, and that's sad to hear because honestly, yeah, half half of my ideas are period pieces and stuff. So that's why they'll probably never get made. It's no, like it's one and of the suck, you know. dark, like the first, <laughs> the first thing that goes out on adaptations of books is like, okay, so you said it modern day, and then you like everything is always you said it. Wow. Modern. Wow. Don't cell phones screw up so much of storytelling? Nah. I mean, you know how reliable your cell phone is? Come on. <laughs> or Google Maps and, and some oh, of the other things. I yeah. didn't call it a day. It's nice to be. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to do horror. Okay. Okay. Stop being humiliated. And I got uh, Orange. Okay. What are the names of the twin siblings of Thomason in The Witch? Jesus Christ. A lot of witch. Nobody talks in the movie. I have nothing. No idea. Mercy and Jonas? That's ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> uh, I have a five, and I'll stick with the Beatles. Can I just point out, because we did last time we played, there was also like multiple questions about the witch. And you got them all. But I'm just saying, this card deck, that is like the sixth question about, about the, the witch. witch. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, whoever wrote this. I really, really like the, the witch. They were like, oh, God, I got to turn in this deck. <laughs> the witch just came out quick. <laughs> I like the witch. I'm not saying I don't like the witch, but come on. Uh, yeah. I would never, I've never seen the witch. That's fantastic. Oh my God. All right. I had a five for the Beatles. Okay. What song did Paul write for a Mary Hopkins single? Oh, Mary Hopkins. Jesus. Mary Hopkins. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. Goodbye. I don't know that song, but okay. And that is why we frequently do not play the Beatle Trivial Pursuit. I understand. That's awesome. I, that's like I have RPM, and nobody ever wants to play the RPM one. I did not break it out for this game, unfortunately. <laughs> um, brown on silver screen. Silver screen brown. What U.S. presidential or what U.S. president's portrait? was visible in a reflection in Jane Fonda's apartment in Clute. Kennedy? Kennedy is correct. Very good. Halfway there, Christina. All right. Ridiculous. All right, I'm going to do Doctor Who. <laughs> God, this is going to be... As a former writer of Doctor Who comics, this will be equally humiliating, I'm sure. Which Doctor did you write? Uh, I wrote Matt Smith. I wrote, uh, what did I write? I wrote like a four-issue mini 
a two issue mini and like a one shot. That's awesome. It was very nice. It was very fun. And I would like yeah, to point out that the dice on the Doctor Who set are multicolored Daleks. Ha! Huh. <laughs> uh, yellow. Yellow. In Night Terrors, what was the name of Jim's bulldog? God damn it. <laughs> I'm going home. I am home and I'm going home. <laughs> Do you want to try horror horror? Give me a horror one. Do you want to answer your next question about the witch? Yes, I'd like to answer more questions about the witch. <laughs> well, the answer. Okay. Um, what 1982 film was credited to director Toby Hooper? Poltergeist. And producer Steven Spielberg. Oh, yes. Poltergeist. Yeah, there you go. Poltergeist. And Steven Spielberg nice. did not direct it. There's multiple people, including like the, the cinematographer and the cameraman, who have all said that it's a lie that Spielberg directed it. He was on set a few days and talked him through stuff. <laughs> Just saying. I like it. I have Thanks. a four. <laughs> oh, you want Beatles again? Uh, all right, let's see. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going to do, I'm going to do silver screen. Okay. I, sh I will eventually do Dr. Uh, what did the title of 1950s Winchester 73 refer to? A gun, a rifle. Yes. That's easy. Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> I, I love that movie. All of his, honestly, I came late to him, but like all those Anthony Mann directed Stewart Westerns are fascinating. They're great movies. Yeah. As you get older, seriously, I, I, I now understand when all the old men in my uh, family would be watching Westerns or war movies. And I'm like, really? And now I'm like, oh, I kind of get it on some of the good ones. Not so much the war movies, definitely the Westerns. Liberty Valance. Liberty Valance. I think the man who shot Liberty Valance is yeah. like, if you want to understand how this country works, yeah, like that is it. Because oh, it's, yeah. it's like, no, no, America wants you to be smart, but you also have to look like a murderer. <laughs> it's really the only <laughs> way that they'll give you any power whatsoever. <laughs> you have to look like both a genius and a sociopath. And you're like, no, that's pretty much pretty much spot on. That's really, really where we're going. <laughs> that didn't come up in phone class, but I agree with you. That's awesome. Outstanding. All right, right now it's 10. Christina has ten. I have six. Josh, right behind in four, though. Not, not, uh, not out of it. Not proud of it. Um, <laughs> no, we're proud of it. I have a green silver screen. Green silver screen. That's production. Hold on. Grabbing the card. Who received two hundred thirty-eight thousand ninety-five dollars a day from Twentieth Century Fox for his work in Cannonball Run? Two thirty-eight ninety-five. Is it Burt Reynolds? It is Burt Reynolds. That is correct. And worth every penny. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, earlier career, very interesting. A lot of his choices. We got, so we saw his last. Like he died shortly thereafter. We saw yeah. he did like an opening for his last movie, um, and he was. Like was so charming, yeah, delightful. Like oh for being God. so charming for being in retrospect on Death's Door, he was so charming. Yeah, just a wow. in delight. Yeah, was that that one where he kind of plays a version of himself and he goes down yeah. to that little BS film festival of his work? Yeah, uh huh. But the, I love that movie. I that thought was, that movie was great. Oh, it was really good. The yeah. irony being, he as a person sitting there clearly did not relate to the movie whatsoever. Like it was very much a like. No, no, that's a character. It has nothing to do with me whatsoever. That is wow. not me. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about that acting. Yeah. That is what acting looks like. Absolutely. No, yeah. I really, I enjoyed that. And, you know, I also enjoyed, um, and now I'm blanking on his name, great character actor, married to Catherine Ross, real deep voice, the the cowboy in uh, Big Lebowski, uh, Sam Elliott. Yeah. Sam Elliott. Yeah. Sam Elliott made this really similar movie called The Hero, like either the same year or maybe six months before. And it was really good as well. Um, and I recommend that as a little cool movie. We'll find it. Did you know that Jane Russell did a TV show with Sam Elliott? <laughs> I did not. What show? The Yellow Rose with Sybil Shepherd, like 1983. Oh, my God. Wow. I yeah. bet that was like a Dallas knockoff or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. That's <laughs> awesome. I remember Flamingo Road with uh, Howard Duff and Stella Stevens and Morgan Fairchild and Mark Harmon. That was my favorite. Mark Harmon really got around. I guess Mark Harmon was Les Moonves's uh, college roommate. Right. I didn't know that. That's amazing. And so that's why he has worked consistently 
since he was uh, 22 years old. Wow. Um, he is a decent actor. I always like Mark Harmon. I think he's likable. He was on St. Elsewhere. Yeah, he was great on St. Elsewhere. He plays more or less the same character on Chicago Hope. Comes back. Sure, he's sure. Like, but yeah, no, it's like this weird, apparently, like, he's just had, he had a pass to do whatever he wanted, and you will always have a network TV show because they were best friends in college. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And yeah. I also like his Carl Reiner movie, uh, Summer School. I love Summer School. We were just talking, we about, were just Summer talking about Summer School. Summer School is an awesome movie. Absolutely. It was, only, it was the only person who liked Texas Chainsaw Massacre as much as I did. Was the fictional <laughs> character <laughs> Chainsaw. <laughs> who was the <laughs> kids, yes. Merely as a person who does not exist in real life. And yet it was me. <laughs> Very <laughs> That's awesome. I do remember that. That's fantastic. Right. Oh, my God. I'll go horror and I got orange. Annabelle Creation 2017 was which of the following in relation to Annabelle 2014? A prequel, a sequel, or a standalone film? Uh, uh, it's a sequel. It is a prequel. God damn it. And directed by, I think that's the one that was directed by Gary. Love that? Yeah, directed by one of the guys who was a, he was a groomsman in my wedding, as yeah. a matter of fact. My turn again. Yes, I have a, I have a three. Um, what are my other uh, choices? Beatles, Star Wars, or Beatles? Um, Silver Screen or Silver Doctor Screen. Who? Or Doctor Who? Okay, uh, I'm gonna do. I'll do Silver Screen. Okay, and what what number did you roll? Uh, three, so it's uh, yellow. Okay. What do recipients of Oscars pledge never to do with them? Sell them. Many things. <laughs> disgusting. Sell them is correct. It's just wow. <laughs> Wait you know, a minute. That's not what you're supposed to do with that. <laughs> Every single one is a disgusting freak. Head <laughs> uh, blue. Blue. Okay. Blue. Where did Phineas Fogg and Paspatuk uh, save Princess uh, Auda from being burned alive? Where? And is that it is a, it is a country? Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure, <laughs> in, and I'll even say, in around the world in eighty days, uh, where did Phileas Fogg and Paspatuk save Princess Aouda, who was, I believe, Shirley MacLaine, from being burned alive? What country? Princess Aouda. I've never seen that movie. Oh wow! Yeah, a lot of cameos. All star cast. It is Indeed. Cast. Philippines. No, I'm sorry. It's India. Yeah. So she plays an Indian princess. Yeah. I believe so. God, it was weird. Yeah, yeah but no, those were the. Day. I mean, good lord! I watched a Mission Impossible where Ricardo Montalban is playing a Japanese man, and he's literally squinting. <laughs> oh literally, yeah. yeah. And that's where you get that great uh, Tony Shalhoub, Shalhoub moment in uh, Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Yeah. All right, horror green. What medical procedure does La Femme try to perform using scissors in Inside 2007? Uh, uh, C section. Yes. Bah. Damn. <laughs> that is correct. Very good. I swear. So it's 11. To seven to five. And it's my turn, so let's see. I will take a Beatles question and I rolled another three. Okay. In 1958, John's band The Quarrymen made a demo record with John singing lead on which song recorded by Betty Holly and the Crickets? I will guess that'll be the day. You have guessed correctly. Woo. I like how our Beatles questions are not hard enough for you. <laughs> that was a total guess. It was yeah. very pun- like when we played, it was very punishing. Yeah, and I know a thing or two, two. about the Beatles. Okay, I, uh, I slept through uh, this local Beatles expert, and he's called Professor Mop Top. Had a uh, had a <laughs> Zoom lecture, and he he literally he goes to libraries and he goes to schools and he and he does these great Beatle chats and yeah, he's amazing. So and we have a we have a great local. Um, Rock show on uh, the, ra- the ra- one of the radio stations I used to work at called Breakfast with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we have breakfast with. The- oh, we have one too. Yeah. There you go. 
I thought it was syndicated. It's not syndicated. I don't think it's syndicated. Ours is produced locally. So, yeah, so huh. it was ours. Huh. Uh, my mom in 1965 won a Beatle lookalike contest on a local television station and got tickets to see what the hell she was John. That's fantastic. Wow. That's excellent, man. It's that I very quickly offer that up to people. <laughs> I think it's super cool, though. They when uh, when they made the claim that they were bigger than Jesus, the first concert that they had to answer uh, the press about was the Chi the Chicago concert that they did, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that was like a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I, when I said that they were bigger than Jesus, I didn't mean from a meaning standpoint. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I will stick with silver screen, and I have yellow. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. All right. Who married aircraft worker Jim Dougherty when she was 16? That would be Norma Jean Baker or Atta girl. Monroe. Marilyn Monroe is correct. Very good. Well Stick done. Thick and horror. I feel good about it. Uh, Blue. Blue. Who directed the Grindhouse 2007 fake trailer for Werewolf Women of the SS? Uh, Eli Roth. Rob Zombie. God damn it. Oh, man. Which I wouldn't have got that either. I, I didn't remember who directed the various shorts. When you said Grounded, so wait, I might know. No, 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 of course not. No. 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 I, I, thought I, I love that movie. God damn it. Oh, it's my turn. Sorry. <laughs> I get wrapped up in the game and I don't realize. Uh, I'll take another Beatles question and I have a four. In I'll Get You... What does the singer think about the women he loves? About the woman he loves? When I think about it, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's that song. Um, and I'll get you. When yeah. does the singer think about the woman he loves? When does? When. Oh. When Sorry. When does. When does he think about her? Yes. I'm going to say the night. It is the night and day. Oh, so it's only half. All right. <laughs> right, so I won't. I won't give myself the point. That's all right. Uh, pink, silver screen. Pink, silver screen. What film had Sugar claiming she always got the fuzzy end of the lollipop? Some like it hot. That is correct. We're in the Marilyn Monroe questions then. Hey. <laughs> is yellow, yellow is the actory one, right? Where they answer real life questions about real people. Yes, they're all invisible to me. Uh, I don't know which one I'll be better at. Let's do Beatles. Do Beatles? It feels like there's less people in the Beatles for me to screw up. Brian Epstein. What member of the Casanovas? Oh, for God's sake! Sat in at drums for the Silver Beatles May 1960 audition. 1960 audition. Oh man! I, I just, like I don't know that. I'm sorry, Josh. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that either. Not Ringo or Pete Best. That is, is my answer. It is not Ringo or Pete Best. You are correct. <laughs> um, Juan Hutchinson. Oh, good old. I got no idea. <laughs> what, what's it? Juan? What? Johnny Hutchinson. Johnny Hutchinson, sure. He's. Uh, I went to Hebrew school with him. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they are tough. I like it. Oh God, again, once again, my turn. All right, um, one, and I will take. I'll take a Beatles question for one. Okay. Who sang lead on "Baby It's You"? See, then that's like super easy. <laughs> it really is. It's just a range. I'm going to guess John, actually. I don't know. Did you say John? Yeah. Yeah, John. Is okay. Him. Okay. I assumed it was John, but yeah. I don't know if I, I got to think if I know Baby It's You. Baby It's You. John. La, 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 la. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, God. I keep getting blue. You want blue again? I don't want it, but that's what I rolled. So. What New York City landmark was the setting for the denouncement? Or the, or pardon me. All right, here. What New York City landmark was the setting for the denouement of Hitchcock's Saboteur? Oh God, it's been so long since I've seen it. Why, why are you looking at me like that? Do you know it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it too. Could be wrong, I guess, but yeah. I mean, it's not the Empire State Building, is it? Yeah. 
Let me look at me. I don't know if I've seen that one or not. I remember from the Universal, uh, like the Universal tour, the like Universal Alfred Hitchcock ride, because it's one of the two or three that they do. Really? That they like create it. I think. Interesting. I don't know, Norman is, Lloyd scene. <laughs> Good old Norman yes, Lloyd. I have not. I don't know. Are you giving up? No, I'm not giving. Because <sighs> Empire State Building seems very obvious, and I, I kind of want to say Grand Central Station, but your face is giving me nothing. <laughs> I'll say Grand Central Station. I'm sorry, I, no. I will say the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is correct. Uh, it's on a crown. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, no, I don't think I've ever seen that one. It's real good. Mm. So, yeah, really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I quite agree. Yeah. It's, they did the thing with the who's, camera. Who's in that one? Robert Cummings, I want to say. Yeah. What year is it, roughly? Like 39, 40-ish? Maybe like, a little earlier? See, and I like his earlier stuff. What yeah. I've actually watched a couple of his silence, and I've really enjoyed those, too. Yeah. Uh, I love 39 Steps. I love Oh, God, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, saboteurs are saboteurs are really good one. Yeah. Kind of strange that Thirty Nine Steps isn't used, hasn't been like remade that many more. Like it was remade as a was it? There's a TV miniseries, I think. But yep. I'm kind of baffled oh, that so no one's good. done anything with it. So it's so good. good. That's true. Uh, purple, which is brown. I'll do silver screen. I'm ready with one. Do it. Who called Felix Unger? The only man in the world with clenched hair. Uh, Oscar Madison. That is correct. Oh, thank God. <laughs> right up, boy. Felix, for God's sake. All right. Getting rolling the dice. I have a five. And, um, no, I've been doing good. I'm going to, I'll do another Beatles song or Beatles question. Who was the first Beatle to have a solo single top the charts in America and the UK? Hmm. It's either John or Paul, obviously. Um, I'm going to say John with Imagine. It is George. Oh, wow. Something. Sure. Or was it? No, not something. Uh, what was it? it don't, they, they don't say. They don't say. Interesting. They don't say, but solo single in the America and the UK. Maybe it was My Sweet Lord. Probably. Yeah, that would be my guess. Well, wow. First George album? I don't know. Uh, it's Christina's turn. Not, I'm very bad on solo Beatles. That's not my strong suit. Um, I'll stick with Silver Screen, and I have Yellow. One second. Oh, Jesus, this is easy, but I'm giving it to you anyway. What actor is the son of Edwin and the grandson of silent film actor Frank Keenan? Say that again? Look. What actor is the son of Edwin and the grandson of silent film actor Frank Keenan? Yes, it's that easy. It is that easy? Probably. What, do you know it? No, it's probably that easy. I'm overthinking it. Yes. He set me up by saying it's so easy. Uh, forgive me. I just know the guy's work. That's why. <sighs> Say it, honey. Say what? Whatever you think it I is. I don't know. I have no idea. It's Keenan Wynn. Huh. Keenan Wynn was uh, the bad guy in, like, uh, the Fred McMurray Flubber movies. And um, he was, always, like, a consummate bad guy. And... Um, He's um, he's Tony Curtis's sidekick in The Great Race with mm -hmm. Jack Lemmon and uh, Peter Falk. Um, you know, him, I think you'd know him if you saw him. Wow. He made a great. He made a great. Uh, he made the Twilight Zone where he was the author, and he would speak in the tape recorder and like uh, yeah. mess with reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's Keenan Wynn. Keenan Wynn, Van Johnson, and Keenan Wynn's wife, uh, notorious threesome in Hollywood. And she left Keenan to be with Van. Wow. No. Hmm. I've learned so much. I've learned so much in this last 30 seconds. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and they wanted Keenan to play Perry White in the Richard Donner Superman movie, but he was too deaf. 
He still continued to work for another several years, but uh, he, he was Richard Donner just didn't have the patience for it, so yeah. they brought in Jackie Cooper. He, he did not make a movie with Jane Russell. There you go. <laughs> anyway, and the two of them did um, Requiem for a Heavyweight with uh, both Keenan and his father with um, with uh, oh, I guess the TV version, the Jack Palance version. Huh. So yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, oh god, purple, brown. Uh, I'll do. What should I do? I don't know. I'll do silver screen. Okay. Did you say silver screen? Yes, sir. All right, I'm ready. Uh, what kind of ca a car was James Bond issued in Goldfinger? An Aston Martin. That's correct. I mean, I won't make you do the DB5 part. That's all right. It'd be ridiculous. <laughs> I have a, a cor remember. I don't know if you guys remember when I was a kid. Corgi cars were a big deal, and they were I like, I didn't that? know what that is either. They uh, they were like, you know, you get the Batmobile, you get the Green Hornet, Black Beauty car, all these uh -huh. different, and the and the James Bond car. And I recently uh, bought a Corgi that was uh, made for the Golden Eye era, but it's like close enough. I don't need to spend hundreds of dollars on this. <laughs> Fifty dollars was fine. Close enough. Oh, it's my turn again. Excuse me. Um, a one. And I'll take a Beatles question. Beatles? Okay. Because um, I seem to be doing well with those. Which Beatle came up with the idea to film the group rehearsing for a concert appearance? I'm going to say Paul. That was Paul. Okay. I heard finally they're, they might be uh, releasing Let It Be. Really? That's what I'm hearing. What's the holdup been? I don't, I think mostly probably embarrassment <laughs> of them, like, yeah. you know, yelling at each other and stuff. I mean, and there's so many great scenes of like, like George, like, you know, Paul's correcting him on stuff. He's like, I'll do whatever you want, whatever pleases you. And, That's you know, it's like, crazy. you know, and, and Paul, no, no, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to make the song better. You know, and it's, oh, it's so great. Remember, it broadcasted somewhere like in the late 70s and my dad taped it so we had a recording of it that we used to watch but it is very uncomfortable to watch i man i saw it uh we had a great revival house in evanston by northwestern university uh called the varsity and that's the first time i saw it was there and in the uh napster days i know i bit torrented it years ago <laughs> and i'm not proud of that but again there was no other way to get it yeah, there's no way to get it like, no, I, it's I okay that. It just, yeah. you know Okay, I will stick with silver screen, and I have pink. Pink. What film featured James Garner and Donald Pleasance as roommates? Oh, and, oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm not even thinking. What film featured James Garner and Donald Pleasance as roommates? I don't know, but I want to watch it. Right? You, I bet you have. Well, I wouldn't focus on the roommate part, just the actors together, because they had a lot of scenes together. They were buddies in this uh, uh, multi-cast uh, movie, ensemble movie, directed by John. Um, oh God, he's so good now. I'm blanking on his name. Not John Ford. Um, <laughs> I can't give you any more hands. Um, John Sturgis is who I was thinking of. Uh, what? What are you looking? If I told you any other stars, you might get it right away. Yeah, I got it. I know where it is. What? Is, was it like? What? Is it like the longest day or bridge too far? Close. Like... Yeah, very close. <laughs> <laughs> is it a D-Day movie? No. 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 But, but come on, you can do it. I can do it. Yeah, you were so do close, it. Christina. It's like the doodliest film ever made. It, it kind of is, yeah. But it, I mean, I don't know. I, I just think the story is so great. The doodliest film mm -hmm. ever made? Steve McQueen in it? Because <laughs> if he's not, then it's not the doodliest film. No, he isn't. He isn't. He's in it. Come on. He's, yeah. Oh, my God. It's the great. one he's on a motorcycle? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> Fantastic theme song. I reserved and sweet wife swear. Look That's awesome. Oh my god. 
I think there's a time limit. Yeah. No. I, think we have to, I think we have to flip over the cards. I'm sorry. It's the great escape. Yeah. yeah. It's the great escape. Dun, dun. Close. Oh, I love that movie. Hello, Headley. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or Henley. One of the two. Sure. He's Don Henley. Only That's a great movie. Everybody, that is your, that is probably, would you agree, Josh, the best man on a mission, you know, men on a mission kind of movie? I think Magnus and Seven is pretty close. Agreed. Mm. Same um, director, too, and a lot yeah. of the same cast. Like, it's, the thing about Magnus and Seven is that Magnus and Seven is almost, like, self-aware of what it is, right? Like, it understands that it's like, no, no, this is, we're coming to the end of these movies. That's, like, that, can't, that's very can't interesting. Like, these movies are about a society that doesn't exist anymore, and we can't keep making them. And that's like, that's ironic, because they have been, they still make those movies, yeah, frankly. I, I no, mean, but, even, you could say Ocean's I, Eleven is that kind of movie. The new Ocean's Eleven, the new Earth. I don't know. I think, I think, I think Madison Seven's, like, about the end of that, that era of Hollywood, right? Like, at the end of the stars, and, like, as you're getting into the 60s, and even, like, Steve McQueen just showing up, Yul Brenner, and, like, right. you know, I, the way he behaves, which is not how you behave on a, on a <laughs> with a star, and you can just see that he's like, oh, I don't care. I'm gonna do whatever I want, you know. Well, you're right about that, but then yeah, I mean, I just think of you know, Guns of Navarone, Forts Ten from mm -hmm. Navarone with Harrison Ford. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, and even some of those bad when the Canon guys were trying to make big movies, they were putting together like big actors, men on a mission kind of films, and like right. David Niven right. in his late seventies is right. tooling around, you know. But, yeah, they uh, existed. I think those are just those are such, like, those feel like, and yeah, like the Dirty Dozen. Like there were there was a ton of those movies, but they were all kind of knockoffs, you know. Absolutely. Oh, no question, hundred percent. And again, it was Sturgis. I am fascinated by John Sturgis, especially his really early stuff. And he made two early fifties movies with once again Ricardo Montalban. That honestly, it's like uh, Montalban is a much better actor than we give him credit. And especially if you look at these early yeah. movies, he made a movie called Mystery Street. Uh -huh. Where yeah, yeah. I, I love that movie. It's like one of my favorite forgotten noirs. I think it's a forgotten noir. And then um, he made a, a boxy movie called Right Cross that is really good too. Oh, Mar yeah. Marilyn Monroe's in Right Cross. Yep. Yep. At a girl. Did you know John Sturges directed a Jane Russell movie? <laughs> I did not. Which one? Underwater! Exclamation point. Outstanding. That's. <laughs> because Howard Hughes wanted to make a movie that featured Jane Russell in a bathing suit. Makes sense to me. I got no problem with that. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Underwater. Fantastic. I got green and I'll do horror. Okay. What 1964 Japanese film is based off a Shin Buddhist parable? What year? 1964. Is it Haosu? Onibaba? Oh, Onibaba. Yeah. I don't know where it's from. It sure looks like it's from the 60s, but I don't think it is. Hmm. I'm rolling. I got a one. And I will take uh, Silver Screen. Silver Screen. Okay. What 1940 Arabian Nights film began with Jafar's ship arriving at the port of Basra? Is that the Thief of Baghdad? That is the Thief of Baghdad. Baghdad. I'm gaining on you. I'm uh you've got 13, I've got 11. Oh. Josh has 7. Our daughter says uh that her mom should hurry up and win. Is what she says. Is that what she says? <laughs> we could we could wrap at 15 if you guys want. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. I will I will stick with silver screen and I have orange. Orange portrayals. Oh, uh, who did Richard Burton portray in Anne of a Thousand Days? I have no idea. Henry VIII. Nope. Nope. Not, yeah. Yep. Not knowledgeable on Burton. No worries. I've been watching a lot of Burton. He did a four, like four uh, half hour uh, segments on Dick Cavett's show when it was only a half hour. Wow. And such an intense interview. It's fantastic. And he's a great storyteller. Great storyteller. Uh, green, I'll do horror. What is the name of the American chemical weapon the government releases to combat the creature in The Host, 2006? I got nothing. That is Agent Yellow. Mm. Rolling. 
That's um, what's his name? Uh, Bong Joon Hoon's like that was his American Breakout. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh wow. I have a six, and I will take the Beatles. A six. Yep. In help. What does Clang use in an attempt to remove Ringo's ring in the recording studio basement? Well, I know they, they saw his drum set in a circle so that he drops down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say electric saw. A what? An electric saw. Uh, yeah, a chainsaw. Yes. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're singing uh, that. Honestly, uh, that scene when they play "You're Gonna Lose That Girl" in the recording studio. That's when I'm like, I want to work in a place like that. And I know that's when I was like, I eventually will be working in a recording studio. Is that where they? That's oh, that's not where they have like the sunk. No, they have the sunken living room like in their apartment. They sing. right, right, yes, hilarious. Yeah. No, just them, just them like playing, and you see uh, George and Paul sharing the mic, uh, singing backups. And yeah. Ringo's smoking while he's drumming. <laughs> Hilarious. Seriously. And it's so well shot. So beautifully shot. Yeah. Okay. I will stick with silver screen and I have pink. Pink is titles. What film featured Bruce Dern trying to save the last of Earth's plants and trees with the aid of three drones? A great sci-fi movie. Yeah. I know. Dana. Attaboy. I do too. My God, my, my lead is dwindling. I have no idea. It's silent running? It is silent running. The droids were called Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and they predated R2-D2. Mm -hmm. It's a great movie. Uh, yep. Uh, yellow. Yellow's real people. Let's yeah. do... Let's, let's do silver screen. I'm ready if you're not. I'll do it. Go for it. What actress was named for a Bordeaux wine? Jesus Christ. You're going to laugh when you, when you hear the name. Zinfandel Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, a fine porn career, but not the one we're looking for. Uh, Margot Hem Hemingway. <laughs> Margot Hemingway. Ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Yep. Oh my god. All right. Once again. Sorry. Four. And I'll take the Beatles. Because I'm on a tear. What instrument did George Martin overdub on the Beatles recording of Baby It's You? Uh, steel guitar. I don't know. Is that? It's a Celeste. What the hell? What's a Celeste? Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's not a steel guitar, but I don't know. It's like a harpsichord -y. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, I'll stick with silver screen, and I have brown. Brown is on screen. What actor didn't survive the parachute jump and reduced the Dirty Dozen to 11? <sighs> oh, that's one of your 60s, so... Uh... They have like yeah, they have moved out of my sweet spot. I have no idea. That was Trini Lopez. No, oh, not Trini Lopez. Yeah, bring back that Marilyn Monroe card. Did you guys see? Speaking of Trini, Trini Lopez, uh, the Sinatra in Palm Springs documentary. No, no, it's amazing. And Trini Lopez was a like Sinatra really liked his music and stuff, and really helped him out. And uh, he had great Frank stories in the uh, documentary. It was pretty cool. It's all, it literally is about the three houses that he had from the late 40s, early 50s to the big compound that he had at the end. Huh. But yeah, it's really, our, and, and yeah. his relationship with Palm Springs, it was our cool. only, our only like, uh, our only like, here's what we're going to do when we retire is to have a Palm Springs house because yeah. Palm Springs is great. That's amazing. And I don't blame him. Yeah, and man, cool. his, his early, his two early homes are pretty amazing too. And one of them, he had recording equipment in the house. And it's great. It's all this old 50s like recording equipment that I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, one of the big uh, TV and radio stations donated their old equipment to our high school radio station. And we were working with equipment from the 50s. And I'm just like, oh, my God, that reminds me of school. That's fantastic. Yeah. So anyway. I got blue and I'll do silver screen. Where'd I already go? I didn't no, go yet. You didn't no, go yet. Okay. 
No. All right, settings. What notorious pre-Broadway stop was the setting for the final scene of All About Eve? I missed the word in the yeah, middle. No good. worries. It's uh, what notorious pre-Broadway city was the setting for the final scene of All About Eve? Where do they preview shows? Is that your city? Is that Chicago? I'm sorry it is not. It is New Haven, Connecticut. God damn it. Mm. And I have a five. Uh, I'll do another Beatles question. I want to try and tie uh, Christina. Okay, what number? A uh, five. Beatles. Who was the first Beatle and rock musician to record an album of standards from the big band era? That's Paul. That is Ringo. Ah! It sounds like, a Ringo. It sounds thing like a Ringo thing. Well, I guess like only you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that was, you know, I'm assuming it's from that album. I, we obsess over how Ringo is the talentless one. It's just adorable. You know, the, there's, there's a Lennon box uh, CD set. And uh, Ringo did uh, Only You, you know, the Platter song. And um, it's there's a version of it where Lennon is singing the song to the same backup arrangement that, I guess, Ringo used. And it's like him showing Ringo how to sing the song. Yep. <laughs> and it's fantastic. And it's great. I mean, really. And it's just, it's like very casually sung by uh, by Lennon. But it really is great. And it's much better than uh, poor, poor Ringo's version. Yeah. Poor, Ringo. poor Yeah, poor Ringo. Incredibly wow. rich, still alive. Loving and it. adored. Yeah. Yes. Touring, you know. All right, here's my more talented friends <laughs> to back me up. Like Joe Joe Walsh. <laughs> yeah, no problem, Ringo. Hang on. <laughs> okay, I will stick with silver screen, um, and I have yellow. Yellow, okay. How was... Oh, this you might get this one. How old was Rudolph Valentino... When a perforated ulcer killed him in 1926. Oh, God. Is he 32? Oh, so close. 31. Damn. I was going to say, I didn't, you know, I, I, I kind of want to give it to you because I was going to say, I'll give it to you if you're within two years. What do you think, Josh? Yep. I'm into it. Yeah, let's do that. Better than I would do. I know that. <laughs> All right. Are we only playing until 15? I'm just curious. I, to, 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 I mean, if your kid's lonely, I, I feel bad if your kid's lonely. For my kid. <laughs> She's nine, I should point out. And she's yeah, six. absolutely, man. All right, yeah. you're you're real close, Christy. You're you're at fourteen. Okay. I'm at uh, twelve, and Josh, you are at uh, seven. Oh, but I'm gonna get double points from here. Yeah, here you go. Exactly. Um, I got yellow. I'll do. Uh, I'll do the book. Ooh, all right. Let's pull out the book. Fantastic. There we go. Category free, so I don't have to answer about individual people and their names. <laughs> uh. Who won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role in the 1966 film The Fortune Cookie? I do have a multiple choice if you want to hear them. Yes, multiple choice me. A. George Burns, B. Jack Warden, C. Richard Benjamin, D. Walter Matthau. Uh, Matthau. Matthau is correct. That's, the, I believe, the first time that he and Lemon team up, and it's a great right. Billy Wilder movie. He's a shyster lawyer and very funny in it. Right. My turn again. What a weird career. What a weird thing, those two. <laughs> Number two, or I got a two, and I will take another Beatles question. Okay. Ringo. Which two songs were released as singles from the Revolver LP? It's got to be, I'm guessing, is it Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane? Uh, Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby. Ah. Wow. They go together so well. I mean, they're really <laughs> complimentary songs. <laughs> <laughs> I love Revolver. Ro Revolver and Rubber Soul are my two favorite Beatles. Yeah, yeah, those are they're mine my favorite, too. too. Yeah. 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 I love the White. I mean, I don't love all of the White album. I do love a lot of the White oh, album. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and Let It Be. and that, Well, not so much Let It Be, but Abbey Road, definitely. You know, I was going to say... On uh, on uh, Rubber Soul, Run for Your Life, Stalker Song. Yeah. If I catch you with another man, that's the end, little girl. Yeah, it is. Um, Yikes. Yeah, it's not as easy to listen to as when I was a kid. Well, I, I, I'm surprised, although I'm sure it's, it would cost a fortune to license it for a film. Yeah. 
But it's like, yeah, there, you know, because and it's such a sad, it's sad because it's such a catchy song. And then you hear the words and you're like, hey, wait a minute. I'd rather see a dead little girl than to be with another man. Yeah. Yikes. John. Yeah. Shame on you. All the Jerry and the Pacemaker songs that are all about, uh, <laughs> uh, what's it called? They're all about. Um... Evisceration. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do it? No, because they're all about statutory rape. They're all it's young girl. Mm. <laughs> like they're all. They're Are all, you really? Yeah. Well, because they're well, you know. Uh, uh, I started standing there. She was just seventeen. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're really young, though. I guess. Yeah, I don't remember because I just know how do you do it? And fairy crossed the mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Which did you ever hear that story? It's awesome. Uh, Frankie goes to Hollywood. Did a cover. A fairy cross the mercy, and they put it on the back of uh, the forty-five for relax, literally as a gift to Jerry uh, from Jerry and the Pacemakers, and say, "Hey, man, you you deserve a lot more money than you made in your career. Here you go." Aww. And it, and because the single sold so well, like you got a nice chunk of change from it and everything. Oh, no idea that Frankie, Frankie, <laughs> Frankie, so noble. You know, we were. <laughs> it's another terrible, salacious story about Frankie. Obviously, relax and what relax is about. We were. <laughs> We were playing it on one of our oldie stations until it was pointed out to the program director. You know what this song is about, don't you? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, and we were playing like at five o'clock right during rush hour. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. It's like, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, too goddamn funny. This is match point. Okay. Yeah, this is it. I'm going to stick with silver screen, and I have pink. Oh, this is an interesting one. I, I wonder if you're going to get it. What was Alan Ladd's last film? Oh. And I got it wrong. I, I, I have no idea. The Carpetbaggers. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. little soap opera thingy. Yeah. A great soundtrack. I thought uh, I thought Nevada I thought Nevada Smith might have been the last one he did. That is a Western Elmer Bernstein. That is an Elmer Bernstein soundtrack classic. That's awesome. I'm gonna have to look up that uh, theme song. It's not it's not coming to me right now. I got brown, and I'll do horror. 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 What is the relationship between Amelia and Samuel in in Baba Duke? 2014. Uh, mom and son. Correct. Nice. All right. I am th uh, two behind Christina, and I'm rolling. I have a one, and I will take the Beatles again. In the film, Let It Be, which Beatle plays drums while Ringo is on the piano for Octopus's Garden? Paul. It is John. Oh, that's amazing. It's usually Paul on drums. That's fantastic. I would not have guessed that. I guess not. That's awesome. Okay. Huh. Okay. Uh, pink again on silver screen. What film saw Peter Sellers' note I like to watch? Being There? Being There is correct. And we have a winner, Woo! ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Well what? done. Unexpected. What? Did you kick my butt? Yeah. No, it's <laughs> that was excellent. No, I'm really glad, and I'm I thank you for uh, bringing in the Beatles questions to change things up. But that was excellent. I knew you. That that was. I thought to myself again, if there's anybody, if there's anybody who can you answer these, these ridiculous, ridiculous questions, Beatles questions. <laughs> uh, it gives me a chance to uh, do the imitations. That's great. So, <laughs> well, this was great, guys. I I, I know Gable is waiting. So we'll wrap up, and I'll say uh, I'll th thanks for playing. Uh, once again, the title of the Anne Dvorak book, Christina? Is Anne Dvorak, Hollywood's Forgotten Rebel. And keep an eye out. Hopefully in about a year, you will be seeing mean, moody, magnificent Jane Russell and the marketing of a Hollywood legend. Amazing. And seriously, what an incredible life. I can't wait to read your take on it and uh, get that kind of objective opinion because, like you said, all we've had is Jane's uh, autobiography, autobiography for all these years. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. no, that's excellent. And uh, Josh, uh, I uh, look forward to whatever next TV project you've got brewing, or uh, per perhaps with uh, the time off, maybe uh, maybe a comic book thing. I'll just be sitting here building a fortress <laughs> and a 
then a room underneath it, a bunker that we're going to live in. Uh, we got a lot of water and uh, cereal boxes. A lot of leftover Girl Scout cookies. A lot of leftover Girl Scout cookies to protect us. <laughs> that's all we have. Uh, that's it. That's what we're going to live on for the next several years while the world burns. So, yeah. And, and uh, by all means, uh, dip in, get uh, Christina's and Dvorak book. And uh, again, uh, peruse the Fialkoff Creator Own Library available at Amazon and many of your local comic shops if you hunt around. They are well worth picking up and uh, getting into the minds of uh, Christina Rice and uh, Josh Fialkoff. I thank you guys for playing, and uh, it was great talking to you. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other eventually, <laughs> post-apocalypse. Post <laughs> One, One, One day. And thanks for playing Lockdown Trivia tonight. Thank thanks, you so John. much.